Okay, so the on the maximum parsimony, the best tree is the shortest tree, the tree requiring the fewest mutations. The question is, how do we, for any given data set, find the maximum parsimony tree? How do we find the best tree? Well, here's one algorithm, one recipe for how to do that. Let's say we start up by constructing a list of all the possible trees for some data set. We have an alignment with some number of sequences. We start out by drawing the, all the possible tree topologies, all the possible groupings that we can think of for this particular uh, size data set. Then for each tree, we say, we try to determine, okay, on this particular tree, how many mutations are required by our data, just like we did in the previous lecture. On this particular tree, how many mutations would be required for this particular data set. When we're finished, when we've looked at all the possible trees, we just select the shortest one from the list. If it should turn out that there are more than one tree that have the same length, then they are by definition equally good, equally parsimonious. We have no way of choosing between them under this particular criterion. Okay, so this sounds like a reasonable approach to finding a parsimony tree, but it of course leaves us with a new set of sub-problems. In particular, first of all, we need some algorithm for how to construct a list of possible trees. How do we do that? How do we, for a data set of 20 organisms write up all the possible trees, for instance. Secondly, we need an algorithm for determining the length, the number of required mutations for any given tree. I mean, we would do it by hand before, just by sort of looking at the sequence, saying, oh, we need a T here and a G here. But if we have a large data set, this will, of course, be uh, impossible. So we need some sort of computer algorithm that for a given tree and a given data set can tell us how many mutations are required on this tree. So let's just look at how we solve these two subproblems. First, constructing the list of all possible unrooted, as it were, trees. How do we do that? It turns out that a very simple algorithm is to gradually build the tree one leaf at a time. If we start out, as indicated on this slide, by building a tree with only three uh, species, then there is just one way of doing that. So we just pick the first three species in our data set and construct a phylogenetic tree from that. It will have A, B, and C sticking out. There's no grouping, that there's, there's nothing uh, ambivalent about that. Starting with that tree, we can now add the fourth species. As it turns out, we can add the fourth species in three different places. And we can add the fourth species in three different places because there are three branches on the initial tree. So we could put species D, we could put that on the B branch, on the C branch, or on the A branch. Okay? So for each branch in the original tree, we can add the next species, giving us, in this case, three derived trees with four species. From each of these, we can now add the fifth species, and it's the same principle again. On this particular tree with four species, we can now add species E in five different places because there are five branches on this tree. So we could add it on the a branch, on the B branch, on the C branch, or on the D branch, or in the central branch, giving us a total of five possible derived trees. We could, of course, do the same for the two other starting trees. So each time we have a starting tree, we can add the next species to each branch. Then on that resulting tree, we can add the next species on each branch, etc., etc., until at some point we hit the total number of species, and at that point we will have the list of all possible trees. So, problem number one solved, sub-problem number one solved. We actually have a simple algorithm for how to build the list of all possible tree topologies. How about finding the length of a given tree? Well, that uh, is an algorithm that also exists. There are a number of ways of doing it. A very important algorithm for doing this is called the Fitch algorithm, and that's what I'm going to explain to you. It's, it's a very simple algorithm. It's the type of thing you can do in the back of an envelope if, if you're really bored and trying to make a maximum persimmon tree. Okay, so here's a tree. We have just a single nucleotide to keep things simple, but if you have more nucleotides, you just add it up for every nucleotide position. So this is essentially a one nucleotide alignment. We have a, C, C, A, G, and they're located on the tree in this particular manner. This is not the most parsimonious tree, incidentally, for this particular data set. It's just uh, to show you how you would compute the length of this particular tree, because as I said, we have to, com to compare all possible trees for any given data set. But how many mutational steps are required for this? Well, 
Here's the algorithm. I'm just going to put it up. I'm going to read it out to you, and then we're going to walk through an example of how that works. The idea in the Fitch algorithm is that you start out by rooting the tree at some arbitrary internal node or some arbitrary internal branch. Secondly, this now gives you a rooted tree where there's a direction where you have uh, parents and descendants. You then start by visiting some internal node X for which we have no state set. I'll return to what that is, but where we know the state set of its immediate descendants. So a state set could be a number of possible nucleotides. So for a leaf, there is just a single nucleotide, namely the nucleotide that's actually present there. So an internal node where we don't know the state set, but where we know the state set of its descendants would be an internal node having two terminal, uh, having two leaves attached to it. Okay. If these descendants, if the state sets in these descendants have something in common, then we assign that to X. If they do not have anything in common, if these two descendants have no common states, then we assign the union, the total totality of all the states that they have, to our internal node X, and we increase the tree length by one. I'll explain this on the tree again also. We then repeat this going down the tree, walking down internal nodes, adding possible state sets to all internal nodes until we reach the node. At this point, the length of the current tree is whatever it was at that point. Remember, we increased it by one every time we had to, to assign the union here. So let's just walk through an example so this will hopefully become clear. So we start out with our tree. We now pick an arbitrary internal branch to root it on. So let's say we try we place the root on this internal branch. So I pull down on this internal branch and say this is now the root. I then fold up the rest of the nucleotides so we get this rooted tree. So this is the same tree as we started out with. I just pulled down the internal branch there and folded up the nucleotides. Okay. Step number one in the algorithm, this was step number one. Step number two in the algorithm is now to visit an internal node where we don't know the state set, but where the state set of its immediate descendants have been defined. So one example is the node over here at the left where the descendants are C and A. So the descendants have state set C and state set A. They have nothing in common. Obviously, they're two different nucleotides, and we therefore have to uh, assign the union of these uh, nucleotides to the internal node. This has a C, this has an A, they have nothing in common. We assign the union to the internal node and we increase the tree length by one. So the length so far is one. Why is the length one? Well, what we're doing here is actually we're starting to think about what the ancestral nucleotides could be in a manner of speaking. Okay, so this ancestor we now say was probably either a C or an A. If it was a C, then there were zero mutations on that branch, but there must have been a mutation on the branch leading to A. If the ancestor was an A, then there were zero mutations on the A branch, but there have been, has been a mutation on the C branch. So no matter what state this ancestor had, there must have been one mutation corresponding to a tree length of one so far for this subtree. Okay, so let's move to the other side of the tree. Again, there's an internal node over here with the A and the G. Again, they have nothing in common, so we have to assign the union A and G to that internal node. We have to increase the tree length by one. No matter what the ancestral nucleotide was here, there must have been one mutation. We now get to this internal node. One of the descendants of this internal node is a leaf with a C. The other descendant is an internal node with state set A and G. Again, they have nothing in common, and we have to assign the union A, C, and G to that and increase the tree length for the same reason that we did before. We're now down to the root. One descendant is an internal node with A and C. The other descendant is an internal node with A, C, and G. Now they do have something in common. They have A and C in common. So we assign that to the root. We didn't have to increase the tree length. We're done with the algorithm, and we can now note that the total length of this tree must be three. One way of seeing that this is true is to actually try to put in, to make one ancestral reconstruction and see that the number of mutations fit. So one possible reconstruction, there are actually other possibilities, is this. We assume that the ancestor was an A and that all the other ancestral nucleotides were also A. If that's true, then we can see there's been one mutation on the branch to the C. 
another mutation on this branch to the C, and one mutation on the branch to the G. So all in all, this particular tree with this particular data set, three mutations are required. That's what the algorithm was supposed to tell us. And you can see that we could do that for any given data set for any given tree. So both of our subproblems and solving the maximum parsimony problem have now been solved.